Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Grant and this is CNM Glass. Today our focus is for Module 8, our first week of Section 3 with our class 2030. And today we'll be talking about surgical guidelines and a second video to go about go over uh, surgical coding and some rules with integumentary system. So let's get started. Some of our key points. We're focusing on chapter 25.1 through 25.5 this week. Each week we, for the rest of this term, we should be in chapter 25 uh, in different sections. So keep in mind that there will be a total uh, review over this chapter at the very end of section three. We'll be looking at today some of the rules with surgical procedures and some of the guidelines you'll find in the CPT coding the differences between open and closed surgical procedures, as well as some of the different types of procedures, the surgical package and what it includes, as well as a review over global days and modifiers that go with that. In part two of today's lecture, we'll be talking about some of the specifics of integumentary. So let's get started. To start with, the surgical procedures is very similar to ICD-10 PCS. And for those of you that have already taken that class or may remember that from 1015, it's important to remember that ICD-10 PCS is very anatomy-based, whereas CPT coding, especially with surgery, is very interpretation-based. And so when we look at this, we have to interpret, in, in PCS, it's very to the point cut and dry. But in CPT, we have to interpret the purpose and the intent of the procedure based off of the documentation from the provider. So let's look at the different types of procedures before we get started. To begin with, I've put up on the board here just kind of a little bit of a, a sample of diagnostic versus prophylactic versus therapeutic. And the thing to remember is with diagnostic, just like with diagnostic testing, we're looking for a problem that the patient may have signs and symptoms of. Oftentimes with the diagnostic procedure, we may go in and attempt that diagnostic procedure and then convert it to an actual therapeutic procedure because we found something during the diagnostics. In that case, we would code based off of the therapeutic procedure, not the diagnostic in most cases. So remember, when we do a diagnostic procedure, we are looking for the problem we should be coding based off of where we're looking for that problem at, and we'll talk about that as we go through each body system. Prophylactic is a just in case of a problem. This is a more of a preventative measure, and it's done to prevent the patient from having a problem later on. This is especially done in terms of like uh, IV fluids, when the patient does not have a need for IV fluids, but we want to make sure they stay hydrated after a surgery in case they get dehydrated. So that would be one example. And the provider will use uh, terminology about prophylactic measures. And then therapeutic is your most common approach to surgery, which is to treat a problem. We're doing a surgery because they have a problem. We know the problem or suspect we know it, and we're going in to fix it based off of that. The next terms that we have are the differences between open and closed procedures. Unlike PCS, where we have different approaches, the only approach that we really look at is open or closed, and oftentimes we'll use the term laparoscopic. Okay, so remember the ter terminology scope identifies a um, or scopic identifies if we're doing something uh, endoscopically. And if you look over on page 719 of your textbook, you'll see that they've brought in some of the same terms that you're used to with PCS, if you remember that, or if you're taking both classes at the same time. We have here percutaneous endoscopic, via natural or artificial opening, and via natural or artificial opening endoscopic. So remember that even though they're using some of these same terms to kind of make sure that you look at them all the same, in, in CPT coding, we typically have either open, which is where the provider opens up the patient, they make an incision, and those are terms you're gonna have to look for at times. Did they make an incision to open the area, or was it through a scope or some other means um, without having to open the patient? So the biggest difference is an open procedure is a lot more risky and it's a higher payment uh, and includes a lot more detail. 
whereas a closed procedure does not cut open the patient. Okay, so when you're reading through your information, you have a couple of examples here on surgical approaches. You have the difference here, vaginal hysterectomy for uterus, 250 grams or less with removal of tubes and or ovaries. And this one, you can see here the surgical procedure for the uterus, vaginal canal is the entry point, endoscopic is the use for a natural opening to avoid surgical entry through the abdomen. And so the way that we know that is because it's not indicating to us that it's open. And if we look up code 58262, we can probably find that that is in a section that indicates to us it's laparoscopic or not laparoscopic, sorry, that it's endoscopic, meaning it went through the vaginal opening. So I'm gonna look that code up with you here. 58262. In my CPT book, I'm currently using the 2019 edition, uh, which is the same edition as your 2018 for this class. Many of you have picked up the 2019 edition. If you don't have that, that's fine, but you will need the current edition when you're in the actual field or taking your test. And I'm looking at 58262, which should be on page 396, 58. Two, six, two. Vaginal hysterectomy for uterus, 250 grams or less with removal of tubes and or ovaries. When I look to see what section this is under, it's under hysterectomy procedures in the section for excision or removal. Okay. If I look to the next page, however, I can see that laparoscopic hysterectomy Hysteroscopy is in a separate section. And in fact, if I look at my textbook for 58542, laparoscopy surgical supracervical hysterectomy for uterus 250 grams or less with removal of tubes and or ovaries is listed under the section for laparoscopic, which is 58542 and also under the section in my CPT book that says laparoscopy slash hysteroscopy. So this is one way you can kind of look at it. Pay attention to the organization of each coding chapter as it relates to the surgical section. Okay, so that takes us to our next piece, surgical package and global days. So we have here a really good breakdown and this is something I would highly recommend if you don't have the physical book, make sure you write some notes and kind of keep this as a reference, maybe even write it in your CPT book. So in the very beginning of your CPT surgical section, you'll find uh, that there are specific notes and guidelines for surgery. And at the beginning of each body area, there'll be specific guidelines for that body area as well. The surgical guidelines are on page 72 and 73 of the 2019 edition, and they go into details regarding what the services are, are for surgeries, the surgical def package definition, which is something you as coders need to be very familiar with, guidelines for follow-up care, for diagnostic versus therapeutic services, materials that are supplied, uh, how to report more than one procedure, separate procedures, and as with every section of CPT, it gives us a list of all the unlisted procedures. And those are used only when you're uh, unable to find a code that matches the surgery. Um, and then on the last part, it gives us information on the special report, image guiding, guidance, and surgical destruction. Here's the thing about surgery. It really depends. Sometimes you're going to have a surgery that includes anesthesia, and it will say that in the surgical code. Other times, it's going to say for anesthesia services, report or please add, or it may not say anything at all. Likewise, you may have information for radiolo radiological ex uh, guidance included, excuse me, included in your surgical code. Other times, it may not say anything at all. So the biggest thing here is to remember the golden rule. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. And if it's not stated as part of that surgical code, it's not part of it, unless it's part of the guidelines for that. So it's important to remember to look at those guidelines. Let's talk a little bit about the surgical package and not worry so much about the guidelines for each section because we'll be, doing, we'll be reviewing those as we go over each part of the surgical section. So services always included. 
Here we have a breakdown of six different services, and I wanted to write them on the board with you. The first one is the E&M provided after the decision to have surgery. Okay, there's a big piece there. After decision for surgery. And this is going to be the same day type services or during the post-op period. Okay, so we'll talk about that post-op period in just a minute. But when you're, this is talking about these six things that are included on the same day as your surgery. An E&M after the decision for surgery. Oftentimes, though, you have a patient that comes into the ER or inpatient room and they need surgery right away. In that case, a modifier 57, 57? I'm going to double check because you should always double check your information. Yes, modifier 57. Let's add that over here to our key points. A modifier 57 is added to an E&M that is for the decision of surgery if it's done on the same day. So this is one of those times where I'm going to have a modifier if it's not. So to report an E&M deciding surgery, and I'm going to use an abbreviation used commonly in shorthand documentation, which is SX, for surgery. And we're going to append modifier 57. The word append meaning add. We're going to add, we're going to include. So included in the surgical package is the e &M after the decision for surgery. Oftentimes, if a decision for surgery is already made, the provider is still going to provide a regular visit with the patient before they start, where they're going to take things like their vitals, they're going to do a basic exam, they may do a complete pre-op exam, or they may just do an overview to make sure the patient's in healthy condition before they start. In either case, that service is part of the surgical service. Local infiltration, metacarpal, metatarsal, and digital block or topical anesthesia. Okay, so we have local Some blocks and topical anesthesia. So we've already covered anesthesia, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about coding for anesthesia before we did surgery. When you have specific types of anesthesia that are just to the skin, and this is what they're talking about by topical, or just under the skin for local, and certain regional anesthesia services, when provided by the surgeon on the same, or the same professional who is providing the procedure. So not an anesthesiologist providing it, but the surgeon is doing some basic anesthesia, then it's going to be included in that surgery. We don't code it separately. Likewise, we do not code the lidocaine, which is commonly the anesthesia used for local and topical uh, and sometimes the blocks. We don't code those either because that's part of that surgical procedure. Number three, of course, is the operation itself. And notice the word of operation here, not necessarily surgery. The reason I mention this is because an operation is the entire encounter for that surgical procedure. So here, this includes things like supplies, applying sutures, bandages, casting, and so on to enable the patient to leave the OR separate or safely uh, after the procedure. So when we talk about an operation, we have to include any incisions, any whatever the purpose of the surgery is and any closures, as well as treatment for the above, okay? So if they had to stop bleeding, uh, anything that's not abnormal. So if it's all part of the normal procedure, it's included. Now, if they ran into another problem while they were in the patient and they had to do a separate sur surgery 
or an additional surgery, then there's additional modifiers that could apply to say that this was an emergency separate, this was a different organ, this was unexpected. But anything that's expected as typical as part of that operation would be coded. And we'll talk later on about some of those different multiple surgeries when we get into the body areas. So don't be afraid of these right now. Number five, or I'm sorry, number four is immediate post-op care. Okay. And what this is talking about is the assessment of the patient after they've recovered or during recovery, um, any kind of additional decisions that they may need to make as part of that immediate care, um, not including additional trips to the OR. So if they end up having to go back to the OR on the same day, that would be uh, available for them to bill. And you would typically include a modifier 59 or an X modifier for one of those. Now there is an unplanned return trip during the post-operative period, which is modifier 78, but that would not be used on the same day, okay? So keep that in mind. Now follow-up care is including the post-op visits, care for typical complications, pain management, dressing changes, removal of sutures, staples, tubes, casts, and so on, as well as any other services considered standard of care during the global period. Some procedures, however, may require longer periods of post-operative care by the surgeon and as deemed to be acceptable standard of care guidelines for each specific procedure. And for this, we talk about post-op uh, periods. So I wanted to read that out to you because this is one of the very confusing pieces. Basically, the guidelines uh, go further to state that unless they have a, a return trip to the OR, any kind of care related to that procedure, um, if it's not requiring a secondary procedure, is part of this. Even infections, even things that are not expected, if it's part of that procedure. So all care, all related care. Now, on that note, a modifier 24 would be appended to an E&M visit if the patient is seen by the provider for something during the post-operative period and it's considered unrelated. So it has to be unrelated to the original procedure. And so like they're coming in and they happen to have a cold, for example. Um, you would append modifier 24 for any E&Ms during that post-operative period, so long as it is clearly documented that it's separate. Okay, so that's very important. That's one of your big modifiers here. And then the last thing that's included in your surgical care is number six here, supplies provided by the physician's office. There's a few exceptions here, but for the most part, all or most supplies, bandages, and so on. And this is really a... Um, a billing question because sometimes you will end up adding a uh, casting and so you will you will charge for the casting itself um, or you may send the patient with the DME service and that may be included separately but for the most part any supplies that they need like bandaging um, or additional gauze any kind of medications that they take all of that while they're in the in the surgical office is part of that visit and so we don't code separately if we give them, say, some uh, medications in order to help them with the pain. So let's talk for a second, uh, going back to number five here, post-operative period and all care that's, for all care that's related. The post-operative period is something you may remember from week one when we did our online field trip to Novitas and CMS uh, to look at specific codes and see the physician's fee schedule. If you don't remember that part, it's okay. I'm gonna put in a link this week so that you can go back to that first week field trip
and take a look at some of those items because in there, you may remember one of the things we can find is the post-operative period for a patient. Post-operative periods are 0, 10, and 90 days after the day of surgery. So in other words, the day of surgery, so it's either 1, 11, or 91, including the day of surgery, where we say all of this is included in that service. Now, the post-operative part is the only part that's after day one. But in major surgeries that are 90 days, they also include the day before. And so technically are 92 days because they have that pre-op service with major surgeries. Remember that the C with the line above it is shorthand in medical documentation for width. So if I'm looking at all of this is included in a patient's surgery, I have to remember that the post-operative period is also included and cannot be uh, billed without certain modifiers to indicate to the insurance that it's not part of this. So the last modifiers I wanted to talk to you in this video are modifiers for uh, planned related surgeries after, during the post-operative period but after the day of surgery and unrelated surgeries during the post-operative period after the day of surgery. Our other modifiers here, 56 and 54 for example, are talked about in our textbook on page 726 of your textbook reading in the Let's Code It section. And these are talking about um, modifiers indicating that the provider that's seeing the patient is providing their post-operative or their pre-operative care, I believe. Oh no, I'm sorry, post-operative care only or only the surgery. So in instances where the patient sees two separate surgeons that are not billing together, they may get some post-operative care from one surgeon while the other surgeon does just the surgery and those do bill separately. And so that's 56 and 54. For modifiers 58 and 59, I want you to look over on page 722 of your textbook I'm sorry, 58 and, and 78. On page 7, 722 of your textbook, you have a couple of examples here. So let's look at the definition for 58. Staged or related procedure or service by the same physician during the post-operative period. Remember, the post-operative period is either 0, 10, or 90 days, including, not including the day of surgery. If I'm within this period and for some reason we were only able to do part of the surgery today and we plan on going back or there was a second surgery that needed to wait for the first surgery to heal. A good example of that may be when a patient goes in to do a coleectomy and as a result they have a coleostomy performed uh, while the coleectomy, uh, the sections of the colon that were remaining are healing. And so the provider may plan on taking the colon back and putting it back together once that body has some time to heal and the swelling goes down so that it has a better chance of uh, completion. So in that case, a staged or planned procedure for the reversal of the coleostomy in order to put the, the colon back together is planned. And if it's within that initial 90 days from the coleectomy, then we would add a modifier of 58 to that surgery, that second surgery, to say, hey, we planned on doing this, here we are, and now we're doing it. This will all be in your documentation. The example they gave us here is a 31-year-old patient who suffered a fracture of the upper arm and had severe damage to the shaft of his humerus, the right upper part of his arm. Um, he goes in for a procedure uh, to, for the fracture and with that a bone graft to support the healing and then a second surgery is planned for an osteotomy. Okay, so at that point the first procedure was performed and we did a treatment of hum humeral shaft fracture with insertion of intradermal implant with or without uh, cricklage and or locking screws. So that was for the mesh or the bone graft, I'm sorry. And then the second surgery Osteotomy of the humerus with or without internal fixation, staged procedure by the same pr physician during the postoperative period. So code 24400 already says staged, 
but because it is also a stage, they wanted us to still add the 58. And so that's a good example here. Now the difference between that and an unplanned surgery is on 70, modifier 78. Modifier 78 applies when the patient has been sent home and is planned on having a regular treatment period and instead ends up having some sort of complication that requires additional surgery. An example of this may be when, if we take that same cholectomy patient and instead of doing the coleostomy, they decided to put the colon back together right away, but it started leaking. And so as a result, they had to go back in and do, do a coleostomy. This would be an unplanned return trip to the OR and would end up having a modifier 76 on the second procedure. The additional example they give us here is a 14-year-old who burned her left arm when she was miscatching a flaming baton during cheerleading. Ooh, that sounds scary. Five days ago, the doctor applied a skin graft to the burned area. She's admitted today because the graft was not healing properly, and they're going to do a new skin graft of the same area. Uh, this one being an aloe graft. So they were both aloe grafts. Oh, this one is actually a repeat procedure. I'm sorry, this example I just read is for 76. So modifier 76 is just a repeat procedure by the same physician that was unplanned. Going down to 78, they didn't give us an additional example, which is perfectly fine. So we have a good idea, an unplanned trip. Was it the same procedure? Was it a different procedure? That's your biggest two between these. And then your example here being the allograft was the same would be a 76. Had they done a different type of procedure in this example for, the, for Lily Drummond, who had that skin graft, if the second procedure was different, it would have been a 78. Go ahead and make sure you read through the modifier examples in this, in this part of your chapter. And you're going to read through, uh, for surgical coding, 25.1 through 25.4. The last one that it talks about is unusual services and treatments. And it's good to make sure you read through this because it talks additional about modifiers that will apply. After this, go ahead and watch the second lecture video for integumentary procedures. We'll see you in just a moment.